Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast Record Club, where each week one of us picks a record for everyone to listen to, and then we review it. And this week, we're doing a special record club, not just because it's a record one of us picked, but because it's also one of the many albums we're talking about this year that's celebrating its 10th anniversary coming out in 2013. And that, of course, is the most pointed at album on this podcast, the the incredibly podcore Jason Isbell's Southeastern. Absolutely it is. And then this is, of course, Morgan's Record Club selection and, of course, a Record Club selection that coincides with the 10th anniversary of the album. Morgan, why don't you tell us what we need to know about the context for Southeastern and, of course, why it means so much to you. So around the time that Southeastern was getting made, Jason Isbell was in the process of getting sober. This comes after a tenure with famed Southern rock group, Drive-By Truckers, during which he wrote some of his and their most beloved songs, such as Outfit and Goddamn Lonely Love and Never Gonna Change, some of which are still uh, staples in his live set to this day. But after he was quite abruptly fired from drive-by truckers for his drunken disorderly behavior but after which he would uh continue to write and perform music under his own name but it wasn't really until southeastern at which point he gets sober and begins the long-term relationship that he has with his wife amanda shires that things really start to take off for him this was a real, a real sort of watershed moment for Isabel. Yeah, so, so naturally through uh, being raised by my parents and given their music taste, there are a handful of country and Americana songs that I had grown up on, loved. Uh, but this was really the first full album experience after years of growing up on punk and metal and just alternative rock music in general. Uh, this was the first sort of country album that I ever heard that completely and fully captivated me. The incredibly rich storytelling and the extraordinary sense of melody and emotionally expressive musicianship on here. Yeah, this is a, a, an incredible album and one that holds a lot of weight for me. It's a pretty significant record for Jason in like multiple senses. It's the kind of album that almost has this sense of like it was predestined to kind of be this moment of clarity that would define his entire life artistically you know if i can be as bold as to say that even though it's far from easily his greatest record and indeed i think some of us even have preferences for other uh, isabel records and but the point i'm making is that it felt like it feels and i suppose this is a retrospective thing but in some senses the narrative of, of isabel as a songwriter as a musician kind of feels as though there's a there's a period of his life that is spent honing his craft through drive-by truckers and through his early solo work that in a sense is really all kind of leading to this moment you know coinciding with him getting sober a year before the album came out and then his marriage to amanda shires which i believe coincided with the release of this album i think you know it was this milestone in isabel's life you know this this the, the getting sober the kind of making good with and and marrying amanda and releasing this record that essentially was a way for him to artistically express all the things that he'd been feeling in the years leading up to and then in the wake of his sobering as well because that event as well that that negotiation between this old version of him this unstable dangerous reckless version of him and this kind of newfound calm that he's kind of discovered and embraced is the core dynamic that defines the theme of Southeastern, the feeling of these songs, the tension that exists within them, the melancholy, the beauty, the hope, all of those things are crystallized so beautifully into this just captivating and immaculately conceived set of songs that do carry this weight of an entire life, you know, that that may be artificial, that may be a weight that we project onto it, but it's definitely reflected in the quality of the songwriting. Jake, um, what what's your history with this album? What's your kind of overall feeling on this particular point for Jason and what the album represents? I'm not going to stray too far from the pack here and saying that this is an incredibly important album to me as well, because a lot of, you know, 
as I've gone on, on many albums on this podcast, me, Morgan's musical taste was passed in many ways from his parents directly to me. Uh, and so this is no exception here. This is one of the first albums I really ever remember being important to Morgan that I explored through basically nothing but that context. And, you know, growing up where we grew up, it's not like this was my first exposure to country music or Americana or all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, I grew up weaned on the music of people like the Dixie Chicks and Bruce Springsteen and all that kind of stuff. But it's always stuff with a more pop lens, I suppose. The idea of country music in the form of an album hadn't really been, you know, thrust upon me until Jason Isbell's Southeastern, which was already after I had listened to a fair number of singer-songwriter records that had uh, captivated me in a similar sense. But what really floored me about this is that, you know, Jason Isbell, as acclaimed and as, I mean, semi-popular as he is now was a guy that back when Morgan recommended this album to me I had no idea who this man was I mean and now I've twice since seen him in concert with Morgan this was something that just felt totally unprecedented to me you hear songs like cover me up and they stay with you and I kept coming back to this album over and over and over again until it and Jason's music became just a part of me coinciding with maybe you know my discovery of rustin kelly's dying star really launched my love and interest in americana which is i think the the one of the universal things that we can all three say about this album is that regardless of your familiarity or even your affinity for country or americana music this is an album that should be on your radar and that you should consider as a gateway into a world of fantastic music if you haven't already listened to it. Yeah, I mean, there's something so arresting about this album. I mean, it's got a gravity to it that a lot of Americana music has, because obviously a lot of music in that tradition comes out of a kind of like sort of deep sort of well of, sort of psychological intensity that is channeled through particular tropes and particular kind of cliches even of expressing the same feelings the same experiences the same modes often to do with addiction and living a life of of sin and, and living in a in squalor essentially or kind of trying to overcome your demons and vices through love and through connection and through stability that you sometimes have to will into existence and often obviously have to come to terms with the fact that it requires some work. And one of the things I love about Southeastern is that it's an album that's very blunt and upfront about the fact that his sobriety, that sobriety for Jason was something that came out of a desire to keep and maintain his connection to his relationship with Amanda as much as it came out of a desire to better himself. It's not to say that desire, wanting to better himself was always secondary, but just that often the course of action, the change in your life that leads to you kind of improving yourself can be one that comes out of a selfish desire to keep someone else around or to make someone else happy more so than yourself. Because often, you know, those addictive states of existence come with a, a lack of self-worth and a lack of care for yourself. Anyway, getting far adrift here, but all, is, all that's to say that those feelings are thoroughly imbued in the songwriting of this record, especially if you look at a song as classic, a song as all-timer song is just completely you know unquestionably maybe the song jason will be remembered for although there's certainly a handful of contenders cover me up i mean the first song on this album it's one of the most beautiful love songs of the last generation as well as being a kind of a, you know a song that reckons with the ugliness of the circumstances of that love for jason at a particular time you know as he's gotten sober as he's kind of overcome that ugly part of his life it's brought him to a, a place where he's able to celebrate and and revel in that relationship for all the ways in which it's mutually healthy and all that kind of stuff but also at the same time there was a period where he needed her there's a period where he needed to be able to use someone else as a crutch essentially and it's a song that's frank and you know emotionally nuanced about what that feels like about what that is 
but also about how that has saved him and yeah it's 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 a it's a lot to listen to emotionally it's and then his performance vocally is just you know it, it reaches in and it just it just fucking pulls the chords around your heart i mean what a song I mean, the majority of the songs on this album are stories that he tells. Obviously, they're all told with his voice and influenced by things that he's experienced, like, you know, the vast majority of songwriters in this vein. But Cover Me Up is one that feels wholly autobiographical in a way that you don't really, like, even beyond this album, you don't really see much of throughout his writing. It's almost a sort of wrong footing to start the album with this song, uh, which is so immediately bare and almost confrontational with the way that he belts out that chorus. There's nothing to hide behind on Cover Me Up. It's just all of these uh, fears and hopes and desires, and it's so beautifully laid out. Again, it's one of his few songs that's that feels wholly autobiographical, but it is, it probably is the one that will transcend any single artist. And, you know, that, that bareness of it, that intensity and that lack of hiding behind a kind of authorial veil, you know, I think that's why it is so powerful as an opener. That's why it's such a statement, right? Because it is, this is a new beginning for Jason. This is a revealing, you know, and you, but you're right. I'm glad you pointed out that, you know, of course, Jason is a songwriter. Jason is a, someone who writes fictional stories and conjures fictional characters. And we shouldn't read too much of Jason's life into the songs, but it is still pointed that the album opens in that way. And, and, you know, the feelings of that songs and the, 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 the complicated nature of a relationship where you need someone and and maybe they need you as well to a certain extent, but it's always going to be from your perspective, it's going to feel one-sided and you're never necessarily going to get a full picture of how the other person is thinking and how the other person is feeling. And a lot of the songs on this record feel very much like they're about one person's perspective, someone who's living a very insular life, someone who can really, who really struggles, I think, to see things from other people's points of view but also still tries, tries to understand, tries to get it, you know, and songs like Elephant and songs like songs she sang in the shower and songs like Yvette, you know, these are songs that are, you know, all the songs in the record are about one person's perspective on their own life and on the lives of people around them. But you get a sense through the craft of, of Jason's songwriting that he knew he he maybe never will quite fully understand them he only understands the characters in these songs i mean only ever understand other people through their own lens essentially and it's it it adds this wrinkle this kind of dynamic to the character based storytelling on the album that i love you know it's a small element of it because i think most of these songs are about a character who is very much kind of embroiled in their own shit right is dealing with their own demons essentially dealing with how they kind of continue how do they go on? How do they kind of em embrace the world? How do they how do they figure out how to the, live their life in the wake of some dramatic change? I think Live Oak is, is a really you know potent song about that feeling, uh, as is Different Days. Any of these threads that you guys want to pick up on in terms of things that Jason writes about, things that make the songwriting on the record particularly affecting? I'm really loath to figure out or to even think of an example of a greater opening line to not just a song, but an entire album than the opening lyrics of Cover Me Up. A heart on the run keeps a hand on the gun. You can't trust anyone. Like that sort of, you get all you need to know about Jason, where he is in his life and the sudden vulnerability that he has embraced and still to some degree feels very uncomfortable with. And I really like that Morgan mentioned that this album kind of wrong foots you by being starting off by being this blanketly very personal autobiographical thing. And that's true. But I think it's sort of a very subtle way that the album teaches you how to listen to it and how to interrogate it in that it combines the autobiographical nature of Jason's storytelling and the more external third or occasionally first person stories that will appear on here. And it teaches you that they're the same. 
the, the these people that Jason writes about to some extent, you know, they're not going to be on here unless they were there was a thread connecting all of them, living with the burden of guilt, living with the burden of something that's from the perspective of somebody who either wants to move on or long since has moved on. Even that opening line uh, keeps a hand on a gun. You kind of have these recurring motifs on this album of Jason referring to himself or just talking about characters who are notorious outlaws or people who, you know, are living a little bit more dangerously, uh, you know, as country music is often prone to do. But it's this very, very simple, but very, very effective parallel to show you how dangerously he at least perceives his own living and his own sort of past life to have been a, a state of complete and total uncertainty and you're just kind of witnessing him mask that and cover me up and i like that too as riley said it's like the the desire jason has to you know improve himself it isn't totally of just himself it's for someone else and i feel like southeastern and jason understand the inherent tragedy of that in that Jason is writing all of these songs knowing that he wouldn't alone wouldn't have been good enough or at least he thinks that he wouldn't have been good or strong enough to have pulled himself past that and that's something that informs all of the lyricism on here it's like it doesn't treat that as though it's like oh yeah I have this person in my life that I bettered myself for but it's just like yeah, but it also kind of fucking sucks that it took an entire other human being to make me claw myself out of the mud because otherwise without that person, I would have been in the mud. And I feel like that it, it just really sticks out the inspiration. I don't want to say something as cloying as that, I guess something more. It, it is kind of inspiring, though, when you learn about Jason's narrative with Drive by Truckers and that he was really kind of the George Harrison of that band, you know, the very the, the soft spoken guitarist who didn't get as many songs as maybe the lead writers in the band but was always a standout and kind of always had that fire in him to become a great artist that maybe the 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 band format just kind of didn't allow him to fully embrace and that maybe some of his personal demons were standing in the way of too and now once you get here you get to see him fully embrace all that it just harnesses all of his potential as an artist for example i i think that the previous albums that he did like here we rest and and sirens of the ditch uh and even his album with the 400 unit the first one those are all good albums but I think it's kind of inarguable that Southeastern itself basically starts a run of records that this is sort of we're living in Jason's imperial era right now as a songwriter, as a musician, as all of that. This is his creative prime and seeing him at the start of all this where it really feels like he's being declarative it is it, it feels like a treat. I see a song like Traveling Alone, for instance, and it's like the chorus of this is seared into my brain in the way that any great country ballad might be and he doesn't sacrifice the structure and the memorability of his songs for their ability to just emotionally lay you flat and that's not a talent that everybody has like normally you have to sacrifice one for the other lean on one or the other here not the case i think that correct me if i'm wrong morgan uh sadler vaden is not on this album right he is not, I want to say he's not. Obviously, that could have been due to circumstances that we know nothing about. But I feel like that's a bit more of a conscious decision, because if you're familiar with Jason, if you're familiar with Sadler Vaden as a guitarist, he is an exemplary musician. Like his guitar contributions to Jason's sound and the 400 unit sound are superb. I mean, like uh, every superlative I can throw in the book are, is with him. But on here there is a conscious decision to kind of rein himself in, to not overshoot his ambition. You know, you're not going to get a song like Children of Children on this album, for instance, where the instrumental bravura of that second half of that song just sort of sweeps you off your feet. Here, the intimacy takes a front seat, especially with songs like Elephant. This is the first time I ever remember being profoundly moved by something like this. Like, I just... I stopped this song the first time I heard it. Maybe I don't even think the song was over. And I just kind of sat down and was like, wow, that's like, I know, I know it sounds childish in a sense, but like 
it was just one of the first times that a topic this heavy had ever been addressed in music in a way that was immediately communicative to me. And I've never forgotten the experience of first hearing Elephant. Uh, it, it was it was a it, it's a heavy song. And, and it's told with a sort of, as you mentioned earlier, a kind of frankness that is like jarring in the best way like a, a part a part of me jumps inside every time he gets to the line if i fucked her before she got sick i'd never hear the end of it which is just like god <sighs> it's a great, one of the greatest things about the song and again it's something that kind of ties into what i was saying about how the album kind of thoroughly imbues the insular world of its protagonists essentially and you only every single song on this record is only from one person's perspective you never get a counterpoint perspective in any of these songs because it's about how each of these characters individually view the world and view the people around them and and how their understanding of the people around them informs the way that they view them the way they behave the way that the, the lessons they take away from the experiences that they have right and you know it's interesting that the, the the only person named in the song elephant is the protagonist who is you know essentially not the the focus of the story you know the story the song is about a girl who is dying of cancer essentially and the man this man who knows her who knows her well who has this obviously very cl- this relationship with her that we come in at the tail end of and we lack context for but we infer through the songwriting that these are two people who know each other very well and can joke about you know the nature of their relationship who can joke about you know her having cancer and the 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 weird dynamic that exists between them because of that and yet you know we never get a full picture you know we we get this person's this very obviously very troubled person the protagonist of the song their understanding of death which comes filtered through this experience with this person who they know for a time and who passes on in an ugly and undignified way i mean for me, the, the 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 passage that really messes me up is the final passage of the song, where he talks about having buried her a thousand times internally, mentally, psychologically, giving up his place in line. That that moment is like I I this song and Sufjan Stevens' Fourth of July I think share a kinship <laughs> with each other because that moment is exactly like the final verse on Fourth of July, where it just hits you with like. Bam! In media res, this person is dead. Well, it's funny and you're as just well, like because I mean I thought of Sufjan as well because obviously the line about no one dying with dignity echoes the fact that Sufjan is a song on that album called Death with Dignity. But what's interesting about that yeah. comparison is that to me the these songs kind of adopt almost completely opposite perspectives on that. You know, Fourth of July is a song about kind of confronting the the reality and the immediacy of death. Uh, whereas this is a song that's about kind of ignoring it, you know, it's about kind of seeing the terrifying yeah. nature of it all and just kind of trying to figure out a way to look around it, to laugh, find something to laugh about, find something to kind of keep you in the moment away from that, you know, and 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 that there's this underlying kind of subtext that that's bullshit and it is what makes the song so, so powerful i mean and that i mean it's subtext until the final verse in which where where jason kind of calls it out but yeah it, it's it's one of the most pointed songs on the record it's also kind of an outlier i i think if i'm to say what the overarching point of southeastern is that jake that jason's trying to make like what is jason trying to say with this album and i think what it is is that we all have ugly shit that we're going through and we all have things that feel like they will be the end of us that can feel so all consuming basically that we can't see a way out of them. But perspective is important. Keeping things in context is important. Seeing things, seeing your life in relation to the world around you, something that's so much bigger than you, something that's so much more complicated than you, and something that contains so much more darkness and so much more ugliness than you could ever fathom is important. You know, it's not a way to diminish the reality of your suffering, but it is important to keep your life in context and to remember that relative to some of the other things that are going on in the world, it's not all that consequential. 
and that there is always a way out of it, I think is one of the key points that Jason's making here. And it all kind of boils down to, to relatively easy, which is the, essentially what I think is the mission statement of the album, basically, is the, is the closing track. And it's the song that really gives you a lens through which you can read all of the suffering of the characters on every single song leading up to it. You know, some of the characters are able to overcome and see a light through their suffering and some characters become so embroiled within it. But at the end of the day, from Jason's point of view, and maybe the thing that helps Jason to really see a way forward is to understand that suffering is a kind of universal experience. And that all-consuming nature of it is one of the fundamental things that connects us all. And that the absence of suffering, you know, and happiness and, and contentment is the exception, you know, rather than the standard and the expectation. You know, Jason said something really interesting in an interview with American Songbook when talking about the song Yvette, which is a song, one of the more kind of dramatic character narratives on the album about a guy who essentially has a relationship with or is feels a kinship to a connection with this girl who's abused by her father and essentially fantasizes about murdering him and within the song's narrative actually seems to go through with that act and when talking about you know writing that song jason said that one of the things the most ugly and shocking realizations for him growing up was that more people were abused in their childhood than weren't having an abusive childhood and, and essentially being abused as a child was the norm not the exception essentially and that jason in having a childhood where that didn't happen to him where he was relatively happy growing up even though he did grow up as a child of divorce, but he still didn't experience any of that stuff. And that, and so he's the exception rather than the rule. He, he got lucky, you know, it's not that it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, it might be to some, a very nihilistic way of viewing the world, but essentially the people who, you know, the people who aren't abused are lucky more so than the people who are abused are unlucky. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, effect of of the cruelty of the world essentially but realizing that suffering and pain is a uniting force rather than something that isolates is something that i think is so core to the epiphany of this album to the thing that makes these songs so empowering and powerful and devastating all at once is this understanding of of kinship through sheared ugliness in the recent HBO documentary, uh, Running With Her Eyes Closed, which I highly recommend if you even like like one of this man's songs. He says, essentially, there's only one story that's ever been told. It's that this is how I feel. Let's compare notes. And mm. I think that really gets at the core of the commiseration of the difficult times in people's lives that are showcased in uh, basically all of these songs. And it's that it's the sort of communal spirit in which it's meant that you see on closing track uh, relatively easy it, to me it's one of my favorite songs ever yes on the right day it can absolutely level me but i think that's kind of because it contains the entire spectrum of human emotion it has this almost like cosmic scale mm. to it in the writing of it yeah and it's like the world is bigger than our problems as well which some might see as a kind of a way of maybe even denigrating someone who's kind of immersed in their own depression and isolation and negative thoughts but really it's a it's a call to action to appreciate the beauty that does exist appreciate the things that you have you know and it's hard again Jason writes these beautiful songs because it's a way of expressing something that doesn't rely on hor the horrendous cliche that I'm going to use. But, you know, it is a thing that's about, you know, appreciating the, sim the simple little things that you have as opposed to being subsumed by the large tragedies and the large catastrophes because it is all always relative it is all every single thing that ever happens is relative there's no one massive event around which everything revolves that's not the way that time works that's not the way that our lives work you know everything is is co in constant motion basically and it's your choice to a certain extent whether you allow yourself to be picked up by that motion and to move with it or to kind of resist it and, you know, that 
difficult thought, which is especially difficult if you're in the middle of, if you're particularly depressed, is I think one of the biggest ways you can kick yourself out of it is really understanding that. And, you know, the other thing the album is about, as well as like, you know, the context of all of our suffering is, of course, transformation. And, you know, obviously, Jason going through a period of real life transformation, of, of changing and the way that he lives. But the album is about characters who are, whether they know it or not, or whether they choose to or not, are in the process of some kind of transformation, who are experiencing some kind of grand change in their lives or in who they are that will either make them or will destroy them depending on how they you know react to it depending on how they move along with it you know i think different days is a key song in that regard as well like reflecting on the way that you used to view certain things in the past the way that you would have treated a certain person in the past the way you would have acted in certain situations in the past and reflecting on how that's changed in a huge way that you may not have even realized how dramatically you've changed. But I think one of the points Jason wants to make is that whether we like it or not, we are always in a process of transformation. And again, like with, you know, the appreciating the things that we have in life versus, you know, being subsumed by the things that hold us down. It's a choice whether or not we acknowledge the, the constant motion, the constant forward movement, the constant evolution and change in our lives, or whether we resist it, whether we stagnate. That's something that's really core to a lot of these songs on the record. Flying over water as well, I think. Traveling alone, too. This idea of being just totally boiled up in your anxieties and in your kind of longings and letting those sort of consume you. Yeah, and I mean, grief is a part of that as well, you know, recognizing a part of your life, what a stage of your life looked like when someone or something was there and a, a part of you and what it looked like when it wasn't. We've already talked about Elephant, but also songs that she sang in the shower as well. I mean, there's a melancholy to this album that comes from realizing the inevitability of change, but then a kind of life-affirming comfort that comes from knowing that that's universal and that that's inevitable and that that's just a part of life relatively easily is the moment the album sobers up from itself. I can't get through the opening two lines of this without becoming a mess, man. Like, I cannot tell you how many times this year alone I have come home from work, driven into the parking lot of my apartment complex, and listened to relatively easy right before I come back in at the end of a shift to go to bed. And I'm wrecked. I'm I'm done. I'm spent. I'm leveled. The, the details in this song are are heartbreaking. The, the, the way that he remembers his friend that had died, the uh, remember him when he was still a proud man, a vandal smile, a baseball in his right hand, nothing but the blue sky in his eyes. And that's that's the great thing about Jason is that no matter what he's talking about, he lends the subjects a kind of lived in dimensionality that is either like hyper literal or deeply abstract. And I feel like the, the literal nature is embodied on relatively easy. And the more abstract nature is kind of embodied on the song that precedes it, uh, Yvette, which uh, that's a song that, again, very jams and T-core reference here. But I when I listened to this this week, the, the second verse, uh, I've watched you in class, your eyes are cut glass, and you stay covered up head to your toe so nobody will notice you the line about her eyes being cut glass and the subject of this song really kind of harkened back to um the twilight sads uh 14 autumns and 15 winters where there's lots of allusions to witnessing abuse like like being close to it in proximity to it not being able to do anything about it but it exists externally to you and that line about her eyes being cut glass like that's just that's a line that could be taken right from there and it's a line that like i still don't know what it means i've listened to this album 50 60 70 times i still don't know what exactly jason is even implying there but it's something visceral and something jagged and something that i remember when i think <laughs> about these songs these tiny details it reminds me of uh the national wasp nest where the lion her eyes are broken bottles and i'm afraid to ask yeah that that's again a lot of what makes jason cool is that um as a writer he has a lot more in common with people you would more typically associate with indie rock 
in that there's a larger pool of, of influence that he he comes from that I, I feel like really informs his work in an interesting way. And hell, like the, the final verse in Yvette, saw your father last night and in the window light made a silhouette, saw him hold you that way, he won't hold you that way anymore, Yvette. Like that, again, is like straight out of that sort of that stand by me, like childhood sort of like immaturity, but recognition of of darkness that ruins innocence and the sort of, you know, put upon desire that you have to to help to do something about it. And that's entirely what that song is. It's like it's feeling helpless, but then kind of overcorrecting for the problem to the point where the character in the song is going to kill this man. And it's something that it's it's very Springsteen, the, the nature of a lot of the character based storytelling on here. I feel like that he kind of draws from the same well that uh, Springsteen did from maybe Darkness on the Edge of Town or Nebraska more prominently, where like all of these named characters and the environments in which they live in are so vivid. I think Live Oak is another great example of that, too, because that's like the story of somebody who has kind of gotten past his demons like this could be read as very autobiographical but this also is like from the perspective of like a fictionalized like outlaw and and somebody who's living trying to outrun himself and that's i think one of the more compelling aspects of this is that a lot of the times country music can be stereotyped as being one thing or the other but Jason doesn't live it, limit himself because he is above all else just a storyteller. And that's what makes him great. And that's what makes like all of his great albums great is that when you listen to these records and these songs, you really do feel like you're getting a fully cinematic portrait of something. And the music does nothing but support that. Structurally, all of the songs on Southeastern are so airtight, they feel kind of impenetrable, like all of the tiny little melodies, all of the guitar riffs, all of the moments where something like, you know, flying over water feels like this explosive moment in the context of the album, or even just the little downbeat on the guitar in something like Different Days. There's just so many moments that you remember, but also there's a, a, an even tide of the rest of the album that sort of just keeps you afloat, but it always feels like it threatens to kind of come against the threshold and drown you, but it never really does. My favorite two songs back to back, not my two favorite songs, but like my favorite couplet of songs on this album is Live Oak into songs she sang in the shower. And I think these two songs Great together choice. give a kind of really highlight some of these aspects of the album's overarching ideas and perspectives um, that I've been talking about really, really well. Uh, Live Oak, in particular, being a song which you've alluded to, being a song about you know reckoning with the change that happens when essentially you leave an older version of yourself behind, specifically when you get clean, and you have to come to terms with this idea of well, now that I'm clean, I am in a better place. Um, I suppose physically, and I'm safer, and all those kinds of things. But am I? Am I a, really a better person? Am I still going to be appealing essentially to the people who who were attracted to me or who came into my life when I was that different person? And, you know, there's that rational part of you that knows that, of course, you know, they're, they're still going to love you. And if, if anything, they're going to love you more now because you're more stable and you're more reliable and you're less destructive. But there's always that part of you that wonders, you know, whether or not when you were at your worst you had some kind of attribute in, in that that made you more appealing. And it could be extended to an artistic thing as well, you know, getting clean and worrying that that's going to mean you lose something that made you able to make your best art or that made you able to contribute something or bring something out of yourself, essentially, that, you, that you've killed now that you've gotten clean. You know, it sounds so, you know, when, when you're thinking about it rationally and when you're thinking about it from a distance, these concerns sound completely ridiculous, but it's a, these are the thoughts, the kinds of thoughts that this character is, is subsumed in. And of course, Jason's writing and the way he expresses it is just, it's, it's beautiful. It, it's stunning. It's gut wrenching. And then the way he uses that, that kind of metaphorical narrative as well that you alluded to jake to explore that idea is beautiful too then you have songs that she sang in the shower selling seashells by the seashore that um 
it kind of works as a sort of continuation of this idea in the sense that you know it's a it's a brutal reckoning with the fact that you know actually the behavior the things that i was doing when i was drunk when i was off on it were things that drove people away and you know the song starts with with the song's protagonist picking a fight essentially and then on the way home being broken up with <laughs> essentially because it was the last straw for this person's partner who just can't stand to be around that ugliness anymore and then this narrator spends the rest of the song sort of subsumed in in guilt and self-pity you know wallowing in these hollow memories of the of the singular little detail this thing that he loved about her that he'll never get to experience again and you know that this it, it's it's both intensely relatable for anyone who's kind of lost someone and maybe for, to some degree that's come out of their own you know behavior or their own sort of ignorance or their own sort of self absorption but it's also you know in the context of the record as well when you think about the songs around it and when you think about the ultimate point that the record makes with relatively easy you know it, it's a it's a moment that feels like a necessary point of reflection right you look at this character and you look at the state they put themselves in and you realize that isn't sustainable and you realize that's a low point and you realize that these are the kinds of things that create the condition for healing that create the condition for change and recognition of that change and the the ultimate message of songs she's saying in the shower reinforces the need for the the protagonist of live oak to get clean essentially because no that ugly person that person who picked fights and that person who, who did all these ugly things when they were under the influence in songs that she sang in the shower ended up alone right and ended up unloved and ended up with only their own memories essentially so you know there is a cycle to the storytelling on the album as well that reinforces the core points that jason's trying to make while also acknowledging that it's not smooth sailing. It's not a clear linear line healing. You know, you have to overcome and you have to deal with thoughts that might try to drag you back to that dark place. And I just find that that sequencing and that cup are particularly effective. I love, I love this album dearly. I, I, I don't know if it's my favorite Jason Isbell record. I think it is at the moment, but I could see that changing potentially i mean he's someone who has like you said jake honed his craft and and kind of realized a prime uh with this record that he sustained and written so beautifully ever since and i'm really excited for us to review his new album and to kind of reflect on where he's at with that record because jason has simultaneously you know maintained this streak of beautifully smooth crafted brilliance for the last 10 years but also feels as though he has come so far i don't think that the stripped back sound here is is necessarily jason you know recognizing his limitations and not kind of trying to overstretch himself more i think that it is jason recognizing that this is a very insular record and the stories are very insular and that the music needs to be very moderate and very temperate and very paired back to really imbue that state which is what makes the embellishment of his sound with you know additional players and with the formation of the 400 unit and subsequent records so satisfying because it's an advancement it's a, it's a we've 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 made the statement i've made the statement i've kind of buried this and now i can move on and that's the the beautiful thing about southeastern is that all at once it is being in the middle and in, um, in the muck and in the mire of your worst moments, but also finding that transform, also recognizing the transformation in your life that is happening and embracing it and healing through that and putting yourself on the road to being someone in a place where you can realize limitless possibilities, which Jason would go on to do with his subsequent records. All right. Shall we rate this bad bitch? Kick us off, Jack. Uh, three favorite tracks. See, the trouble here is that part of me wants to pick the standards, but I'm going to, I'll go ahead and throw and say relatively easy, inescapable. That's my favorite song on here. I'll also throw in Live Oak. I really love that song, and I don't feel like it gets as due quite as much as, you know, Elephant, Cover Me Up, all those, the great songs. And, 
traveling alone that's a that's a song that that was one of the first ones that really connected with me and again a, a song that's undersung in terms of, of praise but something that it, it it has helped me many a wary lonesome night uh i will just say that much least favorite track i do actually have a least favorite track on here it's still a great song but my opinion super eight not my favorite thing here it's a good song, but I mean, it lies between Yvette and New South Wales, which I just oh, fucking I think love. More uh, the issue so... with Super 8 is that, you know, what it's about conceptually fits in completely with the record. I mean, there's lots of different points in the record where it's about kind of interrogating what you were like at your worst and maybe turning that into a kind of yeah. narrative. Um, the, the thing that makes Super 8 not quite work is just that, you know, energetically, it kind of breaks so dramatically from the rest of the album sonically. Yeah. And it just sort of, it, it, it's it's simultaneously a kind of like a breath of fresh air, but also one that kind of kneecaps a little bit the feeling of the album. Um, so it's a weird one. It's a good song, though. Yeah, I I I freely acknowledge that both of those things are true, and that it, it like as I listen to it more, I appreciate the fact that it's there. But it is a bit of a like pace breaker. But whatever, em- emphatically strong nine and a half out of ten. Yeah, it it kind of goes without saying that relatively easy is number one. But for the sake of it, I'll shout out three others: uh, different days, flying over water, and. I definitely want to shout out Stockholm, which yeah, this, this is the thing about this song and uh, Super 8, which is I, I have similar reservations about Super 8's placement on this album, but see, seeing both of these songs performed live has completely changed my relationship to them. And I, I, I love them both very, very dearly, in particular of the two Stockholm uh, that, that is a song for every occasion to me. And I mean, obviously, it is. this is a 10. All the big hitters on this record I love. I mean, if I'm brutally honest, my three favorites are Cover Me Up, Elephant, and Relatively Easy. But I'm going to pick three that aren't that, just to be different, and say that the three songs that aren't obvious picks that I love the most are Live Oak, Songs You Sang in the Shower, and flying over water i i really love that song it's an incredible album i i adore it to pieces it gets a very emphatic nine out of ten from me which gives us an average of 9.5 for jason isbell's southeastern let us know what you think of jason isbell's southeastern and the comments below what does this album mean to you what do you take away from this record and what do you think of our analysis overall bit messy i know but it's just one of those albums that really tears us apart inside so allow us that it's a messy emotional experience stick around also for our review of the brand new jason isbell a 400 unit album weather veins very very excited to be talking about that album very excited to reflect on where jason is at how far jason has come and of course what the new record delivers for mr isbell and all 400 of his units Hit us up in the comments below. Let us know your thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Both those things help us out an awful lot. If you want to go above and beyond and support us directly, you can hit the join button for just $1 a month and get yourself entitled to such perks as your name, the title call of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us some music to listen to and talk about in one of our now episodes, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. Until next time, though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, the Mosaic Company. We help the world grow the food it needs.